Well, good morning. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> that's a tough way for pastor to start. Um, my name is Pastor Bob. I'm so excited about being here. Um, there is no middle school going on today, and because our middle school kids are at white out right now, so I'm glad you guys are here today. Um, today is uh, Palm Sunday, and uh, for me, I didn't grow up church, so I had no reference to what that was. But uh, Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem at Black Palm Street. And uh, in his ministry, for the three years of ministry, Jesus uh, actually, when they wanted to make him king, he actually had to get from that. But now Jesus is riding on a donkey, just as it was prophesied. And people are so excited about Jesus. And I hope you're excited about Jesus today. You guys should be fired up about who Jesus is. And just as when Jesus came, people lined up the streets and they threw down palm branches as a sign of surrender. And they threw down palm branches as a sign of surrender. The king is here. And they threw down their coats and they yelled out one word over and over, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one who saves. And when Jesus came the first time, he rode a donkey. And why that's so significant is that when the Romans would take over a city, when the Romans would take over a city and they came in peace, the emperor, the general, would ride on a donkey. And so everyone knew it was peaceful. But if they rode on a white horse, it meant it was victory. And they were dragging the conquered behind them. There is going to be a day, church, that Jesus returns, and he's coming back, and he's riding on a white horse. And, and that's why we get excited about who Jesus is. Amen? And so we've been doing this a series called Transform, and today's the last series of it. And today is about vocation. And uh, there's a big difference between vocation and life call. You know, the average American will have eight to ten different vocations in their life. But you have one unique life call that God's called you to. It was funny. I was talking to a guy yesterday. Um, we run with, well, he runs, and I kind of go way behind him you know, at the end. And, uh, it's God's time for me. And, um, uh, like it's leaving. But anyway, so we're, we're done. He was telling me that he, he literally is a rocket scientist. And uh, that he worked for the Air Force and he worked for a defense contractor. And, and 12 years ago, he was called to become a teacher. And he kept on saying, how do I live at this level and a teacher's income at this level? And all the doors were opening for him to step into teaching, but he kept refusing it. People in his church, people in his friends, like, can you have really called to teach me? And so he finally gave up and just said, I'm going to go to teaching. So he quit his defense contract job and went to zero and went to school for nine straight months to get certified to become a teacher, a high school teacher. So then all of a sudden when he was at zero, the teacher's salary looked pretty good. But in this, the difference between vocation and life call is that he started talking to kids about life that he started talking about life. He was telling me about the student that he has that, um, that was getting B. And he teaches trigonometry. I can't spell trigonometry. I avoided those classes like the plague. When I was in college, I took for elective bowling, uh, badminton. He was telling me he took a class just for an elective on the uh, uh, on physics on light reflection. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> wow. And so he was telling me about the student that just kept getting D's. And he grabbed him and he met with him. And he says, what, what the problem is, and it's this whole transform thing. He says, you're thinking wrong and you're working wrong. And he started showing him how to think differently and work differently. And he was so excited because this D student on uh, Friday got a 98% on his trick test. Is that when, and that's the reason Pastor Kirk said we're doing transform. Because as a church, we have been thinking wrong and we've been doing wrong. And we transform our mind, right? 
by renewing it, by getting in the Word. And we've been dealing with these seven issues. But today, there's the difference between vocation and life call. And um, one of the things I've been here uh, at Canyon View, I was safe at Canyon View. I've been here for 20 years. And all my years here, I can't remember one time we ever talked about this person today, about David Blythe. And as a pastor, my main objective is to help people understand who Jesus Christ is. And my second main objective is to help people step into the call that God's called them to. Nothing thrills me more. But the truth is, nine out of ten people never step in to the right call. Only ten percent do. And you know why they don't? It's because they have these giants in their mind that says they cannot do it. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the education. I don't have the money. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't. And they have built this giant in their mind that they can't do. And so today we're going to talk about a giant called David. And when I taught Sunday school in, in the nursery, we talked about David Goliath all the time. There wasn't a time I don't think we didn't talk about David Goliath. And so I'm so excited. So what we did is we grabbed some of our kids from children's ministry, and they are going to tell you the story uh, of David Glass. Take a look at the video. Bible asks you to open it to First uh, Samuel, and if you have your transform book, ask to open that up. 
take some notes, and I think this is going to be really helpful. Uh, so we're in First Samuel 17, and it's interesting because it says that David here, or Goliath, whoa, he's so tall. All right, let's move him up so you can see him back. So Goliath, the Bible says that he was seven cubits high, uh, somewhere is somewhere between seven feet and nine feet tall, and that he was the champion of the Philistines. And he had all this armor, and it was the best of technology. And, and it said for 40 days that this man sat and shouted at the king of Israel and taunted the day in the church. And so before, the, before we can get to understand, you know, David, a lot of the other things David is, if you turn your chapter to chapter 16, it tells a little bit about David. So at the beginning of chapter 16, there, it says God had got tired of Saul. And he had taken his anointing off King Saul. And so he wanted to pick a new king. And so he sent his prophet, Samuel, to go to a town called Bethlehem. And he went to Bethlehem. And he found a man named Jesse, because the Lord said, I need Jesse and his sons. And I want to appoint one of his sons as king. And so he went there, and he gathered the sons. Jesse brought all, he had eight sons, he brought all his sons out. And Samuel, he's the first son. And he is big and strong. And, and he says to himself, truly, this must be the man. And the Lord speaks to him and says, no, man looks at the outward of things, but God looks at the heart. And so he said, all right. And he had the first picture, all these seven boys. David's not even there. And Samuel's just going, putting his hand, are you it? Like, nope. Are you it? Nope. Are you it? Nope. Are you it? And he gets to the last one, and he says to Jesse, Dad, he says, are there any more? And then and Jesse says, yeah, there's one more. But he's out in the field. He's kind of a runt, and he really, you know. And the moment he walks in, the Lord says, that's him. That's him. Sometimes I do feel like it's worse than you. Sometimes I feel like you've been in the field is what you're doing. And that might be that you're at home, or you might be the person that we can to do this. But God knows. He knows, and He sees, and He is calling you in a new vocation. But He wants to call. And so that moment, it says that in Samuel anoints David's head with oil. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon David all his days. And see, when we have been called by God, His Spirit comes on us, and we and we can be rest assured that He will never leave us for His sin. But sometimes we feel like that, do we not? Can you guys feel like that? And, uh, and uh, so, like I said, nine out of ten never step into their life's call. They step into vocations. But the biggest reason they don't step into life's call is because they are delayed. The moment... Uh, David got anointed. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He didn't immediately become king and all this. And, and one of the things that happens is that, that people start causing you not to step into what you're called to do. So I want you to, so the first guy that we want to name is the left. Is that we get, a, we get a call and then we don't step into it. So we're going to call this guy delay here. And it says in 1 Samuel 17, uh, verse 14, it says, David was the youngest, the three uh, oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth to Saul to tend to the father to keep him back home. See, sometimes the reason that we're delayed is that people won't let us step in to what we're called. His dad wouldn't let him go. He was held back. And, and, and I find that so true in ministry is that I would step into this, but I have to go to school first. Or I would step into this once I get this. Or I would step into this because as soon as my kids leave the home, it's like God put a life call on you. And you sometimes are held back by loved ones, or you're holding yourself back. And you're delaying, waiting for something to happen. Being in ministry for these last years, I've seen a lot of giants. I've seen giants of sickness, I've seen giants of disease, doubt, all this stuff. 
But for me, when I was like praying, like, the Lord prompted memory back to me. About eight years ago, uh, in May, I was sitting at home, and it was a Saturday, and I'm getting ready to come to Saturday night service, and that is the supplemental Saturday night service. Um, is that I'm watching TV, and on the TV, it, it's at 5 o'clock, and they're doing this, this news story, and they're talking about the shooting out of 32 in April. And they're interviewing people, and they're interviewing these two ladies sitting in front of their house, and their kids are playing outside. And they say, we have just got to get out of here. There's always crime, and there's gang, and they showed all this graffiti, and they showed police driving around, and, and, uh, and, and I'm watching it, and I feel like somebody should do something. Not me, somebody, like one of you guys. And so you know what I did? I just turned, the, I just changed the channel and watched the Star Trek, because it made me feel bad. But then the Lord started setting things into place for me, and I went to L.A., and I went to this little church who believed in not a big giant, but believed in a big God. See, sometimes we believe in a big giant, a little God. And God talks and says, believe in me and don't worry about this. But when I talk to people, the 9 out of 10 that never step in, they always tell me about this God. And they never tell me about the great God. And so I went to L.A., and this little church of 500 bought this old church, uh, bought this old hospital. And it's about the size of the old St. Mary's that had been abandoned. And they had a dream that what if we had a place for ex-prostitutes and ex-drug addicts and, and people in drug trafficking and, and poor families? What if we had a place that they could come and learn what their life call is? And, they, and they, they started remodeling this old hospital with no funds, and God just started providing. And when we were there, there were over 500 people who were living in this hospital, and their lives were changed because they didn't believe in a big God. They didn't believe in a big God. And they started changing my paradigm. And while I was there, this man came up to me, and he said, Bob, because I had a big He said, Bob. And he started telling me, he said, you're not going to believe what God's been doing in my life. The last 18 years, I have been going to this neighborhood, and I have been praying with people, and I've been sharing food with them, and I've seen life change, and I this and that. And he says, you know what it all comes down to, Bob? And he looks me in the eye, and I'm not, I'm not trying to look at him. He literally touches me in the chin. Don't talk about this. Don't know who I am. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> he touches me in the chin. And he says, see a hurt, heal a hurt. See a need, meet a need. And everything came from that time. And so I came back. And I said, I'm going to do that. And so I grab my wife, Pastor Sue, and a couple of friends, and we go out to 32 and 8th. And, and, and I'm terrified because everybody around me is telling me, you're going to stop. This is the stupidest thing you could ever do. You, they go, you're telling me you're going to knock on a door. And every house out there is a drug house. That's what everybody was telling them. Everyone's a drug house, and you're going to get killed. And so I, I went out wearing the pen. And, and I, 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 say, I say to my wife, because I have no courage, that you got to come with me. She said, this is stupid. <laughs> and so I made her get in front of me. And... Uh, <laughs> And we knocked on the first door, and I was just, oh my gosh, I'm so shaky. And it's knock, knock, knock. And I just knew a bigger guy than this guy is going to come to the door. And this little guy comes in there, and he looks like somebody who has been so gone. And he's probably, he's probably 60, but he looks more like 75. And his name is Chuck. That's what Chuck introduced himself to the Um Look at me. No. <laughs> hey, and, and, and I said, you need any food? And he just started to say, I don't have to put it in the house. And he took me in, and he took my wife, and Sue, and we went inside and go to the refrigerator and put some food in there. And, uh, and then he started telling me his life story. He was a life vocation pastor. But I was called to life call to see people come in on Jesus. And this vocation was changed one day. But that doesn't fit with my, my life at all. So he started telling me a story about how his mom was a prostitute. And his mom had him doing that work. 
and continue to do that work, but he was a little boy. He'd run around in this house where all the other prostitutes were, and so the mom starts giving him heroin to calm him down, so he would be high during that time, and so he got addicted to heroin. And so if you start getting addicted to heroin, you, you go down a lot of bad roads. So he was in and out of prison. He just got out of prison for the third time. And he had never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we got to pray with him, and, and he, he first said, well, I'm kind of a good person, and I did it. I'm like, no, oh, we're all in sin, and we all need to stay right? Every one of in this room had to come to that point with him. That I'm not as good as I think I am, and compared to a holy God, I call way short. And in that moment, he asked Jesus to make his own and we were there for about an hour and a half, and and I you know, found out in a couple months he died. But I, when I walked out, I knew why I was supposed to be there. But I had spent months delaying going. And I believe that you have known what you've been called to do, but you're afraid to step into it. And so the second thing is discouragement. So in First Samuel 17:8, Goliath stood and shouted. At the ranks of Israel, I want this uh, circle stood and shouted. Why? Why do you come out and line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not a servant of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become his subject. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subject and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. He's drawn the line and said, So do something. And then it says, Give me a man and let us fight each other. And hearing, I want you to look at this hearing. See, faith comes by hearing. But the second thing comes by hearing. Discouragement. If they talk about hearing, discouragement comes back to hearing also. They said, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all his wives were distant and terrified. And so, when we hear these things, people say, Oh, you know, you're going to get shot. You're going to die. You can't do that. You know, one of the things that people used to tell me is, so you went out there. What about winter? What are you going to do in winter? And then that first winter was so cold. I remember we had people that their fingers were bleeding and, and their little kids were crying because it was so cold that we kept coming out and so we kept going. Is that people are going to speak to church and say, You can't do that. And then it says in uh, verse 24 it says, Whatever the Israelites saw, once you just put the saw, the man, they all fled with too much great fear. When we hear and see the problem and not believe and hear and see God, we will always default to fear. We will always default to fear. When you get that foreclosure notice, you are going to hear and see things. When you get papers served to you by a spouse that says, I'm done, I can't do this no more. When you are told by a doctor that this is what's going on, we default because we think it's discouraged instead of encouraged. The conventional wisdom would say, you shouldn't be doing that, Bob. That's not how you build a church. We've been doing it for eight years, and I've seen hundreds of people come to know Christ, and I've seen hundreds of people baptized. I've seen witches have walked away from witchcraft. I've seen Muslims can become saved. I've seen people who are in the most far places of drugs get del delivered from their stuff. Conventional wisdom isn't always the right answer. It wasn't right for a little boy to face a job. Because God believes that I've called you to a life call and step into it. I think the other one that I think all of you can relate to is you have brothers and sisters. Because they knew you went. Right? You, you think you're all that, David, but you're not. So I want you to take a look at this. It says, uh, when David's oldest brother heard him speaking, what he was asking, 
So David gets there. He's supposed to get some cheese and some food and lunch to everybody. When he gets there, he hears Saul yell out all these threats, and then he starts asking the guys, what's the reward for killing this guy? See, his main thought is like, that guy needs to stop. And, it, and the, the army guys are saying, wow, pretty good. First, you get one a month. Then you get his, then you get his dog. And then the best thing of all, you don't have to pay taxes for the rest of your life. That alone would make me want to go fight. <laughs> Am I not right? And so his brother hears and asks him these questions. And it says he burned with at him. Sibling rivalry is alive and well today as it was thousands of years ago. And you're going to have brothers and sisters who are going to say stuff to you that aren't very nice. But listen to what he says. Why have you come down here? Who do you think you are? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's he, he questioning his, his vocation. But you, you, you think it's so important? You're just a sheep herder. And, and then he says, I know how deep you are. So he starts questioning his character. I mean, within two sentences, he's just bam, bam, bam. Nobody can do that like an older brother or sister. No one can do it like that. Because they know who you are. And then he says, and I know how wicked your heart is. And you've only come to me to watch it. Now he's questioning his motives. And David says, what have I done? Like, right? Anybody has an older brother or sister, like, what's up with you? Seriously, what, what's your problem? And he says, can't I even speak? And he says, sometimes family will be the biggest dream bust of the world. Like, who are you? You're not educated enough. There's no way that you could ever go to school and do this. There's no way that you could ever move to that area and do that. There's no way. If you ever told anybody about Jesus, who would want to listen to your story anyway? I know who you are. And, he, and even though you pretend like you're all Jesus this and Jesus that, I know how really wicked you think you really are. But I'm telling you, David knew he was a boy. He didn't even bring an art to the family things. Just as we watched the story of Jesus when he was confronted with accusations that weren't true, he paid silent to those. You cannot listen to negativity. If you are surrounded with people who are speaking doubts in here, break it off. Stop watching all this news. Stop listening to talk radio. It fills your mind with toxicity. You have got to start setting your mind on the things of God. And that's when you're going to start believing in the things of God. If you were told over and over, our country's going to hell in a handbasket, you're going to start believing it. But we believe in a God who is greater than any president. We believe in a God that's bigger than any Congress. We believe in a God that's bigger than any Congress. We believe in a God that's bigger than any school system. We believe in a God that can do anything. And we're not going to listen to that anymore. Because this is just a little guy to a big God. Amen. Thank you. And then the last one. And I think this is the one that absolutely likes people a Before they even start, 9 out of 10, I would say, by far, this is it. doubt. It says if faith comes by hearing the Word of God, right? Then doubt fills just by hearing all the criticism. And I want you to take a look. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 22, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on the account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight. He has total confidence. But Saul replied, You have to be able to go against this Philistine. It's tough. One is getting held back by your dad, one is getting criticized by a brother. But you're from a king who has experience in battle and has won lots of things. And he says, You can't do this, for you're only a young man. He is at work all his life. And so, what happens is, we face discrimination. David faced discrimination because of his youth. David, and we face discrimination based on gender or race or education. You're not smart enough, you're pretty enough, you're not athletic enough, you're not whatever. And these words have been filled your mind. Instead of saying, this is what the Word of God says. He says, I am more than a conqueror. The Word of God says, He will never leave here. The Word of God says, wherever my feet are, He is with me. 
but we listen to dads, and we listen to brothers, and we listen to people over us, and we listen to our vocation instead of our life, Paul. And I'm telling you right now, you can defeat giants. The story isn't just meant for little kids. The reason that we have lost the wonder of God. You know what? This time, this is really good. <laughs> the reason that we've lost the wonder of God is that we don't tell stories of how great He is. And when we tell stories of, I once was in the room, and I saw God do this, or I saw God do that. I, I see, I mean, this, this last Thursday, I saw people just being healed right up front here and stuff, and they just make it out of the field. I, I, see, I see people who have been carrying stuff all their life, hopelessness, despair, the loss of a child, and they get set free of filled with hope because the giant has been speaking to them. So, how do we defeat this guy? Because most of us, let's face it, most of us aren't going to face a giant. But the real giant is in our mind, right? And so the very first thing that David did is he remembered how God had helped him in the past. See, it says in 1 Samuel 17, 36, it says, Your servant has killed both lion and bear. He's telling Saul this thing. I got this. He says, This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he's defiled the arm of the So if I can kill a lion and a bear, I can just kill this guy. And so when I when I stepped out in, with him one years ago and eventually got the racket club, that God started reminding me that we, before that I used to, we used to do the well, peanut butter jellies in schools to start off with fifty and eventually grew to a hundred, two hundred, sixteen hundred every week. We were in all the high schools and the kids used to call it Jesus. And I we never had to buy any peanut butter jelly. God provided every time for us. He provided all the bread. He provided all the peanut butter and jelly. He provided all the snacks that went in. He provided everything. So I knew that if God was faithful with me in those little things, that He was going to be faithful in the many things. And that if I would just step out by faith to my life call, not my vocation, but my life call, He was going to be with me. And so I just started seeing God provide. You know, I'm telling you this, and I don't say this in any bragging way, but over the last eight years, we have distributed over $3 million worth of food that I have not bought. Because that is how big our God is. And that's how little Goliath is. But if I don't listen to all the doubts, like, where are you going to get the food? How are you going to do this? I'm like, God, that's God's problem. My problem is to step into the life call and to remember the greatness things that God has done. The second thing is to use the tools that God has given me. He said, Saul dressed David in his own tunic and put his coat of armor and his bronze helmet on his head and fastened the sword over his tunic. He tried to walk around like, can you imagine how silly this is? He's just a boy. He's just a boy wearing man's clothes. I imagine his fingers being cut. And then David says, I cannot go on these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And he took his staff, he picked up the, the rock, and he does this. It's because... Sometimes you're going to find people who support you into your life call, but they're going to tell you this is not to do it. You, you need to do this. See, when we started at Kimwood and I think about this, you need to have a building. You need to have a worship building. Like, no, the only worship we have is we stand around and talk about God, the great God. And I love our worship building. And I love our building. But God has called me uniquely to reach people that would never step foot in this place so that they could hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There are so many chucks out there. And then, I got that's the friend you up there. But some of you are thinking, yeah, Bob, that's a nice story, and I got real problems. That's a positive thing to say if it's a real problem. You know, if I, if I tell you, hey, your son's going to come out and watch this thing out of the box and all this, I'm telling you, when you come across a problem, you have to have the existence who God is. And even though it looks hopeless to men, he's faithful. I've been in lots of situations where a dad and a kid are just wrong. Who has been taking a lot of breath. And then I've, I've, I've been in situations where I've done you know, for caskets that are no bigger than two blocks. 
and I told friends about the house that they thought was a good house because of course they didn't like the job. They had to pack it in the hall and move into an apartment. And I'm telling you, unless you know who God is, you will be crushed. And all positive thinking, all the work that I'm going to do this way. But when you can say, I don't know who Jesus is, and he said, he would never lose me to save me. And my heart hurts right now. But he said that he is near to the broken heart of him, and he knows the Christ to be dead. I know him at all. The people that I've done these panels with, and, and, and people who've lost their spouses and all, is that those who know God, if you don't know Jesus, are able to go through it. The ones that don't, they, they, they get overwhelmed and they're defeated. And then uh, the third thing is you must ignore the disruptors. You're going to have people in your life that think that you can't do this. See, there was a time in David's life, see, it's really easy to tell the story of David Goliath. He comes out Victor and chops his head off. And, and all this stuff. But there was a time in David's life when he lost everything. And, and there was a time in David's life before he became king. See, I, I, I believe, based on the scriptures, for most of us, before we get to our life call, we go to the lowest level. Before, see, First Samuel 30, before this first Samuel thirty one to be king. In first Samuel thirty, he's working for the Philistines. The guy he killed, the army that he killed, David's now working for him. Him and his men, he is gone and, he, and the Philistines like him so much that they actually give him a city, a city called Ziglag. And him and his men are out fighting for the Philistines and they come back and they are exhausted and they see smoke. And they arrive in the town, and they found out while they were gone, while I'm doing your work, God, right? An enemy came and destroyed their city, took their wives, took their children, and took everything with them and left. And it said that the men, David's men, cried so much that they could not cry anymore. Have you ever been to that point? That you, like, I can't take this no more. And he said they cried so much. And it says in Samuel... Uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, and it says, And David was greatly distressed because the men were talking about Stonia. The men that he raised up, the men that he called mighty warriors, his best friends, there's a time and sometimes in our life that the closest people to you abandon you. And you are so greatly distressed. And he says, Each one was bitter in the spirit because of their sons and daughters. But I want you to circle this and write this down in your book. And you need to know this because but David found strength in the Lord God. You have got to find a way to find strength in the Lord God. And what I love about it, it doesn't say how he did it. It didn't say he just started reading the Word. It didn't say he started singing. He didn't say, but he found a way to know God is good in this circumstances. And he asked God, what should I do? And he said, go chase him. And he got everything back, and there's a day, and he became king. But he had to ignore even his closest friend and find what God had to say. And the last one, I expect God to help me for his glory. And so David, he grabs the stones, he heads down there in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, If you come, you come against me with swords and spears and javelins, is that all you got? And he says, But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. I come against you in the name of Jesus. You are called to speak to that mountain, and you tell the mountain how it's going to go. I'm sick and tired of Goliath speaking to his daughters and sons and telling them how it's going to go. It is time to rise up, church. It is time to rise up and speak to that situation. It is time to rise up and say, no more. No more. This is how it's going to go. And he says, the Lord of the armies there is who you have defiled. 
You are going to be dealt with, not by me, but by you. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down. It is the God, it's God who does the work. We are just doing our life off and stepping in. And then it says at the end, and it says, and the whole world, verse 46, and the whole world know there is a God in the world. When we step in and we do our life off, God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. People are praising Jesus for this. And he says, and all those who gather will know that it was not by sword or spear that the Lord said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It says, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. It is God who's going to be the Goliath. I'd like to invite the worship team up. So, this summer, I was on a sabbatical, and, and this you know, I was journaling and praying, and, and I wrote this down one day because I started getting really anxious about going back out to camp. Because we've been out there for this is our eighth winter, and I hate winter. And in this last winter, we were out there, and uh, you know, I, I could just quit it. And it was snowing. And the worship band was playing. We have a worship band, and we do a Spanish where we go by the service, and they just come up and they just play. And I'm like, I hate this. I was going to take it out. I'm sorry. And uh, I just saw people with the hands raised up in the room and worshiping this guy. And I was like, I can't quit. He's called me a slow call. But I asked the Lord this summer, I said, God, if you could, I write to God, if you could, would you give us some buses? And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't pray in faith or anything like that, I just prayed. And when I came back in September, all of a sudden, I gave me a little bus. And I said, seriously, and so we were able to do children's ministry at this point. And then in November, he gave us a big school bus. And I was like, wow, that, you know, that's how good our job is. It's beaten for the but if you'd like to help be part of it, we want to remodel that bus and make it into a church. We want to have a place where people can come to worship and worship the thing that they know. So if you have you skills in those, if you'd like to help, we'd love to have you come help. And if you, we have a sign of death, you know, we used to watch this thing go and she would take over. And, and, and you do move the bus and like, hey, this is remodel the bus. <laughs> I grew up in Grant. I grew up in a trailer park. I'm good to live in a bus. And then uh, one of the questions is, how how do you ever become a king? Is that he was anointed, but then he was chained. And then we we're starting this new series called Daring Faith. It starts right after Easter, and then the books are available. And what I love about Doctor Bill is that the guy who doing that he leads a small group on Thursday and one of his books is about more of it small group of people. So I love coming to this every Thursday because I can't ask to be anything else than to be here Thursday. It's just because seven days a week I want to be the people praying for me. And we are going to learn how to live a life of faith. We are going to be like David to rise up with that. And so you can purchase the books at the bookstore. And so I'm just going to ask you to stand right now and we are going to worship this amazing God that takes out time. And I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus, for He is the conqueror. He is the returning king. He is the one who gives us victory. Amen?